Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You're very welcome. And colleagues, just before we start uh, the meeting, once again, I'd like to remind you about uh, the mobile phones. Uh, could you either switch them off completely or turn them to flight mode as they both interfere with the meeting and the recording and broadcast of it. So if you have a phone, please do that. And the note in relation to privilege, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to so do, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statements that you have submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting. And members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So, good afternoon and I'm very, welcome, uh, very pleased to welcome uh, the Dublin Homeless Network today, uh, represented by Declan Dunn, uh, David Carroll, Vanula McLaughlin and Fiona Barry. Uh, Limerick and Clare Homeless Alliance uh, on her own, Trina, uh, Trina O'Connor, and uh, Cork Social Housing Forum, Mr Aaron O'Connell. You're all very welcome and thank you for taking the time to come to us today and supply the opening documents. We appreciate that. As I say, your full submissions have been received, they have been uh, circ circulated and they will be published on the website afterwards. Uh, so I'll start off um, with the presentations. Um, in the order. So maybe Mr. Dunn, you might uh, do the, you're your one person. We take, the, we take the three presentations and then we'll go to the members for the questions. But we'll take all three, all presentations firstly, if that's suitable. So thank you, Chair and Network and um, Committee for inviting us to speak to you today. We greatly appreciate the opportunity. Um, the Dublin Homeless Network is a collaboration of 16 community and voluntary organisations providing services for homeless and socially excluded households. Uh, many of our members are well known, others less so. We provide the full range of specialist services and supports uh, and accommodation types in Dublin, and a number of member organisations provide services around the country. We work closely with the Dublin Regional Homeless Executive, which has one operational plan covering the four counties of Dublin. Uh, my name is Declan Dunn, I'm Chair of the Network and CEO of SOFIA. Um, we four here are the network representatives who sit on the Dublin Statutory Homeless Consultative Forum and the Implementation Advisory Group within the Dublin Regional Homeless Executive. Uh, the network is in existence for many years and meets monthly to work to improve services and respond to emerging needs. Um, I'll make a few opening rem remarks and then the Vice Chair, David Carroll of DePaul, will highlight the recommendations. And we also have Fiona Barry and Fanula McLaughlin from Threshold, Fiona's from Crosscare, to reply to questions on their specific areas of expertise. Um, I know that the committee is well aware uh, that by any measure Ireland's housing and homeless situation has reached crisis point and the homeless crisis is affecting the entire country and Dublin acutely. Uh, housing supply is sig significantly below housing need. The private rented sector has contracted at a time when demand surges forward with the consequent increase in rents. People who are never homeless is now, now li live with their families in hotels. We will never have a truly thriving economy without a functioning housing market. Others will have uh, addressed, other presentations the committee will have addressed, uh, many of the themes to do with planning and, and, and supply, and it's not our intention to address those just to avoid repetition. Homelessness in Dublin, we believe, falls into two clear parts. The first category are those new homeless who tragically find themselves living with their children in hotel rooms um, and individuals living in temporary emergency accommodation, often who are working, um, but they generally have no previous experience of the factors traditionally leading to homelessness. Many of the new homeless have the skills to live independent, independently and are now 
uh, homeless, principally for housing affordability reasons. And with support, affordable housing, properly functioning social housing regime and private rented market, we believe can live independently again. And if they access the homes that they need, then the level of specialist support from our kind of organisations, quite frankly, should be limited. The second category are those individuals and households whose life experience often puts them on a trajectory that includes homelessness. Homelessness is symptomatic of other life events resulting in complex needs. All of us potentially at some time in our lives can experience factors that can lead to homelessness, personally or our family members or our friends or our neighbours. The Homeless Network members are committed to respecting the dignity of every individual and working to support those in our society with complex needs. Many of those who are homeless have come from a background of grinding poverty and chaotic home lives. Often they have been taken into the care of the state as children. Many have been victims of violence and domestic abuse. Some are caught in a trap of substance addiction and many have a poor experience of the education system and lack the marketable skills to provide for themselves and others have mental and physical disabilities. So much of the work of the 16 homeless organisation making up the network is the professional delivery of care and structured support using needs analysis and agreed care plans and case working for people with complex needs affected or at risk of homelessness. This helps those, most of whom have dual diagnosis, to access and engage successfully with external specialist medical services. We're focused on empowering people to provide the varying level of supports they need so that they can go on to live independently. We support the comprehensive development in Ireland of the Housing First model of accommodation with wraparound supports in a way that has been proven internationally to address the complex needs of homelessness successfully. Our submission identifies many de detailed factors relating to homelessness and specific recommendations under four categories. Prevention, ceasing the flow into homelessness, emergency accommodation, access to housing, keeping people who move out of homelessness in housing. So I'd like to hand over to David Carroll, who's our Vice Chair, to briefly take you through our recommendation, if that's okay, Chair. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity today. Our approach to our work is, is pretty straightforward. What we try to do is stop people coming into homelessness in the first place, support people to get out of homelessness, and keep them out of homelessness. And we have a number of um, recommendations today over the four themes that Declan has outlined. The first of those themes is ceasing the flow into homelessness and prevention. The first recommendation that we would have is that housing advice and advocacy which are identified in both the government's homelessness policy statement and the implementation plan on the state's response to homelessness, uh, states that prevention and preventing homelessness has a key role. Therefore, we're calling for a statutory obligation for all local authorities to provide information and advice for those threatened or at risk of homelessness. I'm going to pass over to Fanula for recommend recommendation two. Um, we would like to recommend a reform of the rent supplement scheme to reflect market rent. 15% of an increase in rent supplement is not adequate in the current climate. The majority of the Tenancy Protection Service clients who, we, who threshold got rent increases for was at least 20%, with 150 clients above 40% of a rent increase. Rent needs to be looked at at a local level. For example, a two-bed house in Dublin 2, the rent is 1,668. A two-bed house in Dublin 15 is 1,101. We also think that effective regu rent regulation is the only way to address ongoing unaffordable rent increases. Rent certainty measures linking future rent increases to the co consumer price index should be introduced. HAP also needs to be extended nationwide, along with the HAP place finders, which is extremely successful in Dublin at present. An awareness campaign needs to take place in relation to HAP across the country. Half of the clients that used the Cork TPS were under a valid notice of termination and had, no, had never heard of the HAP payment system. Prevention works. We have assisted over 8,000 and advised over 8,000 callers to the Tenancy Protection Service and so far have saved 2,300 tenancies so that they could remain in their current accommodation and not enter homeless accommodation. I will now pass you over to Fiona Burying from Crosscare who will discuss emergency accommodation. 
So the network's primary recommendation is that resourcing prevention is absolutely key to stopping this crisis. However, until such time as resources are put into prevention and people stop coming into emergency services, we require emergency provision right across the sector as an emergency response. Access to emergency accommodation is a basic human right of a good standard. No person should ever have to sleep rough. I sat outside in the waiting room and looked at the beautiful area outside and just wondered how much money, of, how much funding and how many resources could be put into the provision of emergency accommodation. Resources are also required for placements, placements in people's local areas, because placement is the way that we assess people and ensure that they have an exit out of homelessness. These are required for single people, couples and families. We urgently require additional emergency accommodation. Whilst cold weather facilities were opened for the six months of the winter period, these are closing. So is sleeping rough an option at, during the summer months, but it isn't a human right to have a bed for the night during the summer months. The Brew Emergency Accommodation Facility has gained some attention in recent weeks. Last night, Brew had 58 empty beds with a full staff team inside. It is my understanding from colleagues that 90 people were refused by the Dublin Free Phone because of the lack of emergency accommodation available. It's not just an issue of the Brew Eimshire facility. Emergency facilities are required right across the city in order to respond to the increasing numbers of people coming into homeless accommodation. People coming into homeless accommodation have very complex needs. HSC budgets need to be restored to 2010 levels because we require urgent medical facilities to be provided on site to people experiencing complex medical needs. However, whilst access to emergency provision is absolutely required, our absolute goal is to get out of the business of providing emergency accommodation. It is not somewhere we want people to live in permanently. We want access to housing. And in relation to this, I pass over to David Carroll. Our third theme is access to housing. We uh, work and deal with some of the most vulnerable households and people in the country and in the city. And one of our biggest challenges is obtaining the housing and obtaining gateways into housing within the community again. As Fiona has outlined, it is not our intention to keep people in temporary accommodation for the rest of their lives. We consider that housing and housing-led approaches are key to the approach um, of solving and, um, homelessness for these vulnerable groups. So therefore, we're saying people who are homeless must be prioritised as having the greatest form of social housing need, and priority must be given to long-term homeless households. And obviously, the supply of units to accommodate different household types must be provided. Um, and that's been dealt with by the committee uh, in, in other sessions. Our second recommendation is that a review must occur of the local authority and approved housing body selection and allocation scheme, which takes into account estate management, treatment of local authority arrears, local authority authorities refusing to accept housing applications, and the allocation policies of approved housing bodies. We are also focusing in this particular section, particularly on the under 25s, and we passionately state that single independent persons under 25 have the same housing needs and same housing costs as those over 25s. And there we, therefore, we're calling for a full right social welfare payment should be restored to the under 25s. Our final theme is keeping people who move out of homelessness in housing. Our organisations do a remarkable job, even within the current crisis, to make sure that people move out of temporary accommodation into the community. And a recently uh, established concept, um, which is internationally recognised Housing First, which believes that you provide a housing first and provide wraparound supports uh, at a, 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 in conjunction with that, 